We have to be serious on this video today. Specifically, we have to ask ourselves, if, if the United States were to move into a World War III scenario or some other national calamity, could Joe Biden and his administration declare a national emergency or a wartime effort and as, and, and as part of that, ask Americans or actually demand Americans give up their firearms for the war effort or for the emergency effort? Is this legally possible? I want you to be prepared ahead of time in case the situation were to arise. Stay tuned. Hey folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of The Four Box of Dine, a proud American gun and a constitutional attorney, member of the United States Supreme Court Bar, and author of Disarmed, What the Ukraine War Teaches Americans About the Right to Bear Arms, a series of lessons that the Israelis should have learned before being attacked by Hamas, which would have helped them protect their civilians, who were unarmed by and large, better than apparently they did. Okay, folks, this is an important topic, and I hope what I'm about to say here does not come to pass, but it's important that I prepare you in the Second Amendment community, because I'm not just here to regurgitate what happened in the news today. I want to also make sure that you're ready ahead of time to be safe, to make sure our rights are safe, that our Constitution is safe. So in light of that, I want to ask the question, a legal question, really, can the United States government under Joe Biden, declare a state of emergency, a crisis, a war, declare war, and as part of that demand that Americans, as part of the war effort, or to deal with the emergency that's been declared, demand Americans turn over their weapons, their armaments, their guns, their ammunition, to help protect the country. Well, this may sound a little crazy, this scenario we're talking about, but the reality is we know that Hamas, a self declared or declared uh, terrorist organization has killed, massacred 1,400 Israelis or so in that sneak attack uh, last week just over the Gaza border. And we know that Israel is now in the process of retaliating. And their soldiers are saying things like, we want to you know, get revenge on Hamas. And uh, a lot's going on here because in addition to that very narrow story and that terrible event, we are now starting to see things like sort of belligerent language coming out of places like the country of Iran. I believe we're now seeing the United States sending carrier groups, two carrier groups, uh, to the Mediterranean, specifically to the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, so I don't know what all that means. We know there's a lot of dispute and debate going on as to whether or not the so-called uh, Davos in the desert, which is going to take place in Saudi Arabia, uh, whether or not this is going to take place. So again, I bring all this up not to talk about geopolitics because I'm not going to do that here. But the point is that there's a lot going on on the international stage. And this is, of course, on top of the whole issue with uh, the Russian invasion of the Ukraine. It's pretty clear that this administration is potentially moving towards some sort of war footing. So you put in the fact that you have all of these different things going on around the world, including, of course, uh, China being interested in Taiwan, on top of all these other things. And the reality is, I think this administration may be the dumbest administration uh, in American history, with some of the people leading the charge. You can have that debate. But whatever it is, the point is that we may be on thin ice uh, as a country and as American gun owners. So we have to keep in mind that the Democratic Party has embraced the notion of Rahm Emanuel, who at the time was Barack Obama's chief of staff when Barack Obama was the president. And that was essentially that uh, one should never let a crisis go to waste. Well, what we're facing down here is likely some sort of a crisis. Now, I'm not going to make any predictions about are we going into World War III? Are we not going into World War III? Is this a regional conflict? I'm not getting into any of that because I don't know. And I'm not going to try to figure it out, by the way. Uh, i got to focus on the Second Amendment and related issues. I can't figure out all that stuff. Uh, so I'm not going to get into that. But what I do want to talk about is the question of, is it possible that Joe Biden could somehow declare there is a crisis and shut down, let's say, commercial sales to civilians, dem demanding that all uh, gun companies turn over all of their supplies and, and weapons to the government, uh, and that Americans should have to turn over their AR-15s and ammunition, supposedly because the war effort was is in desperate need of these things. And is this possible? Well, it turns out that there is a precedent 
for Democrats trying to pull this off. Because as you know, in the 1930s with the National Firearms Act, the anti-gunners tried to have handguns. And this is important. We should do a whole video on the National Firearms Act, but for now I'm not going to do that. But in the 1930s, there was an attempt to make handguns be registered under the NFA. And thank God that did not happen. We'll talk about why that didn't occur at some point, but I'm glad it did not. They only succeeded in requiring machine guns and some other weapons to be uh, registered on the National Firearms Act. Now, here's where it gets also interesting, and this is very important for you to know. In May of 1941, as you know, Pearl Harbor's on December 7th, 1941. In May of that year, in May of 1941, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt declared what was known at the time as a state of unlimited national emergency, a state of unlimited national emergency in May of 1941. And he did this in response to concerns about the growing threat of the not of Nazi Germany and they're you know moving toward an attempt at world domination. So what happened is that was in May of 1941 and then this is important and if you're a Second Amendment geek, a Second Amendment historian, this is extremely important. What I'm about to say, this is a very important bit of history for a whole host of reasons, and that is in October of 1941. In October of 1941, a few months before the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, in October of 1941, Congress passed what was known as the Property Requisition Act. The Property Requisition Act. Now, what this said is that the president could determine that it was permitted to use um, you know, any any sort of military or naval equipment, supplies, or munitions or components thereof uh, was needed for national defense of the United States. And he could requisition private property to do the same. He could convert a factory that made, let's say, cars into a factory that made tanks or airplanes or F4U Corsairs or whatever you want to get at. And anything he wanted to do for the need of the national defense or the defense of the United States, he was authorized to re requisition, quote, requisition such property for the defense of the United States upon payment of fair and just compensation. That was the official statute. It was called the Property Requisition Act because it basically said that the government could requisition any property it wanted for the what they was anticipated and turned out to be true, the upcoming war effort. Now, here's the critical thing. So that's important. In October 1941, the Property Requisition Act passed by Congress. But here is what I want you to know. This is mission critical. You know this in the Second Amendment community. Because this is this puts to the lie the notion that the right to keep and bear arms was something invented in the 1970s and 1980s by the NRA, which is BS, total BS, okay? For a bunch of reasons. But let's just focus on this. In October 1941, when Congress enacted that requis Property Requisition Act in anticipation of war, which of course came on December 7th, 1941, just a few months after the enactment of the Property Requisition Act, there was an exception. There was an exception made specifically for firearms, firearms owned by American civilians. That's exactly right. I said it. It's true. There was an exception to the Property Requisition Act for firearms owned by civilians. Why? Because you have a Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms, and you're not allowed to be disarmed. It would violate the Constitution. And Congress in 1941, in October 1941, knew exactly this and did exactly this to protect it and respect the Second Amendment. So specifically, Congress added to this Property Requisition Act an exception. It said, this is what the exception said to the act. <clears throat> that the act may not be construed to deprive people of firearms. And here is the relevant language. Nothing contained in this act, nothing contained in this act shall be construed to authorize the requisitioning or require the registration of any firearms possessed by any individual for his personal protection or sport and the possession of which is not prohibited or the registration of which is not required by existing law. That was a reference to the NFA, of course, from the 1930s. Or to impair or infringe, or to impair or infringe in any manner the right of any individual to keep and bear arms. Period, close quote. Did you hear what I just said? In October of 1941, Congress enacts Franklin Delano Roosevelt signs into law the Federal Property Requisition Act that allows the government, in the name of an emergency or war, to take any private property it needs, provided it provides just compensation. But there's an exception to this law, and again, it specifically says that they could not requisition and take private civilian firearms, or in other or otherwise infringe upon the right to keep and bear arms. October 1941. It's not the NRA. In 1975 or 1985? No. 
No. Even in the 40s, Americans and Congress and the president recognized the right to keep arms, and it was an individual right, not some sort of fantasy collective right, which was invented you know, decades later by anti-gunners trying to destroy our right to keep arms, which they failed, they will continue to fail. So the point is, to the extent Joe Biden tries to declare that our, we, we have to turn over our guns, there's already precedent that says, no, we don't have to, back in the 1940s. So you need to know that history so you can use it if they try to go down there. The second thing to keep in mind is never forget that there's a couple other reasons I want to go into besides the Property Requisition Act. Never forget that the Constitution, this Constitution, our Constitution, has what's known as the Supremacy Clause. Supremacy Clause is found in Article 6 of the U.S. Constitution. The relevant part of Section 6 of the U.S. Constitution provides this Constitution and the laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance thereof shall be, shall be the supreme law of the land. And the judges in every state shall be bound thereby. Anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary, notwithstanding. The point being that the Constitution trumps all. It is supreme law of the land. To the extent any inferior law, whether it be by a state, a local government, or even by the Congress, violates this Constitution, the Constitution trumps. And part of that Constitution, of course, is the Second Amendment's right to keep in arms. So to the extent Joe Biden tries to enact a law, even in the name of an emergency or crisis or war, that contradicts or violates the Second Amendment's right to keep in arms, he is not permitted to do so under the Supremacy Clause of Article 6 of the U.S. Constitution. But beyond that, there's another federal statute I want you to be aware of, and that is Title 42. I'll put links to this down below if you want to check it out later, if you guys want to write a school paper or something about it. Title 42 USC, which stands for U.S. Code, Title 42 of the United States Code 5207 prohibits the confiscation of firearms. It says, no officer or employee of the United States or person operating pursuant to or under the color of federal law or receiving federal funds or under control of any federal official or providing services to any such officer, employee, or other person while acting in support of relief from a major disaster or emergency, from an major, right, relief from a major disaster or emergency may, one, temporarily or permanently, temporarily or permanently seize or authorize seizure of any firearm, the possession of which is not prohibited under federal, state, or local law other than for forfeiture and compliance with federal law or as evidence in a criminal investigation. So the point is that 42 U.S.C. 5207 says that unless you've committed a crime or basically it's part of the NFA or something specific, right, no officer of the United States may take away your gun in the name of a major disaster or an emergency. 42 U.S.C. 5207. All right? So again, to summarize, at a minimum, we know from October 1941, exception to the Property Requisition Act, we know from the Supremacy Clause of Article 6 of the U.S. Constitution in, com in conjunction with the Second Amendment itself, and we know from 42 U.S.C. 5207, the President of the United States is not allowed to take our firearms. And if he tries to take them, we should not give them to him. We should assert our rights, and we shall fight back. Now, as to whether or not Joe Biden and his administration will go there, well, as we know from Rahm Emanuel, as I quoted earlier, they believe that you should never let a crisis go to waste. So we may be very much entering in a crisis territory. Maybe yes, maybe no, I hope not. But if we are entering into a crisis mode here in the United States, the potential for some sort of regional conflict, nuclear conflict, world war conflict, I don't know. Who knows? We don't know. I have to say we have to be very cognizant of those in Washington that may try to take advantage of that opportunity, that crisis, turn it into an opportunity to take away our guns, to disarm Americans, and to convert us from being citizens into serfs or worse. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm not saying I'm necessarily losing sleep about this. But as you know, it's my job to flag issues ahead of time, ahead of time, and give you some food for thought before it occurs. 
that's when we need to have this conversation, not when it's too late. I'm not a fan of waiting until things are too late. It's not my style. And I think you probably know that at this point. So, all right, folks, I uh, hope you learned a little bit something here today. I'll put links to some of this authority down below. You can check it out. It's a great topic for a paper for those of you in school. And again, uh, we'll see you again soon at the Four Boxes Diner. Make sure, by the way, you like and uh, send this video around. I'm trying to spread the word, trying to build the channel up. It's taking time, but we're working at it. And don't forget to follow me on X or Twitter at Four Boxes Diner. And we'll see you again soon here at the Four Boxes Diner. Orders up. Table 2A.